Hello, everybody. Let's get started with our engagement party. Today, we have a lot of awesome people here. Our guests are Michael Zickers, Tobias Koppers, the founder of Webpack, Natila and Nat Natalia, uh, who is doing a lot of things in the area of uh, micro frontends, and Connie. So first of all, I will start with a tiny overview so that you know what we have prepared for you. And uh, then we will go on with two short presentations. Today they are very short. And then we come to the main part, which is about a panel, a Q&A panel, where you can ask all your questions. So let me get started with the overview. Which is, where is the overview? Who has seen the overview? It's here, yeah. <laughs> so, just a second. Oh, yeah, that was the wrong, the wrong slide deck. But here we go. So as mentioned before, this is our engagement body. We want to engage no one less than Angela and Module Federation. And for this, we have prepared several things for you. First of all, I want to give you an overview about how to use Module Federation together with Angela. And today I will limit myself to 15 minutes because I've talked about this topic several times ago. And I will just do this introduction to get everyone into the boat. Then my good old friend Michael will talk about micro front ends in the real world. He has uh, gained a lot of uh, experience with these topics in a lot of in a lot of uh, assignments, in a lot of customer assignments. And so this will be quite amazing, I guess. And then we will come to the main point, which is the panel with your questions for our panelists. Before we start, I have one information for you. I'm sure this is interesting for you. Namely, my good friends uh, in America will do another NG conference. They are currently working hard to make this happen. The team is the Musical, NG conference, the Musical. And it will take happen in April. You can submit your ideas to the CFB now. The CFB is open until this Saturday. And of course, you can already buy tickets. For everyone who is part of a user group or a meetup, I mean, this is true for all of us, you can use this discount code uh, to get some uh, money off. So use your chance, save your ticket, and submit something to the CFP. Okay, so let's get started with the first part of this uh, event. I have called this, as mentioned, Federated Angular in 15 minutes. And when we talk about Federated Angular, when we talk about Angular and Module Federation, we also need to talk about micro front ends because this is what this is all about at the end of the day. And if you ask me what a micro front end is, I would say, well, a micro front end is just a tiny application, a tiny application with a bunch of use cases belonging to each other. And we are writing tiny applications instead of big applications to make it possible to assign one agile team to all of them. So in this case here, I've decided to implement a flight solution. And this solution about flights consists of a booking app, a check-in app, a luggage app, and a boarding app. And as mentioned, we can assign one team to all of those applications. As those teams are small, they can work with agile techniques. They can work in a very agile way and deliver business value on a regular basis. This means with this approach, we are bringing back the agility, even though we have a huge amount of people working on the overall flight-based system. 
But at the end of the day, for the consumer, for the user, we need to integrate all those applications into one big integrated solution because the user is not interested into starting 50 applications each and every morning. Instead, they want to have one big solution capable of everything. And uh, so we need to find a way to load all the micro frontends in, let's say, a shell. Here I have a shell in the middle. This shell has a working area and the main menu. And when I'm clicking here or there, I'm loading the micro frontend into the working area. This looks a bit like lazy loading, but honestly, it is more than lazy loading because here we are not talking about loading one part of our application. Here we are talking about loading a part of another application. If you look closely at the board number, you see the micro frontend is using localhost 3000 and the shell is using localhost 5000. Two different origins. And even though we have those two different origins, everything is loaded into one browser window. The thing is, in the past, implementing something like a shell was quite tricky. You needed to go with a lot of workarounds, honestly, dirty workarounds. But now we have Webpack 5 and Module Federation, and this makes it straightforward to implement a shell like this. It makes it very easy to load stuff that has been separately compiled and separately deployed. And this is what this short overview is about. In this short overview, I want to show you three things. I want to show you what module federation is about. I want to show you how to use module federation together with Angular, how to engage it with Angular. And then I will give you a possible roadmap so that you know when you can use it safely. First of all, let me introduce myself. I am Manfred. I'm a trainer and consultant. I'm offering a lot of workshops, especially for Angular in the enterprise. And besides this, I'm quite connected to the Angular community. I live in Austria. I do a lot of stuff in Germany. And I'm always happy when I can visit other countries and work with companies there. So let's talk a bit about module federation. At the end of the day, module federation allows you to load something that has been compiled separately, compiled and deployed separately. And perhaps you are wondering now, well, why do we need a solution for this? Why can't we just use a dynamic import? A dynamic import to point over there, to load something from over there. And the answer is, well, in theory, this would work. In practice, this does not work with current solutions like Webpack. And so it does not work with the CLI incorporating Webpack. Because Webpack and other bundling solutions assume that everything is known at compile time. Everything needs to be there at compile time. And everything is compiled and built together. Everything is even optimized together. Think about tree shaking. And then, and only then, the big application is cut into chunks for the sake of lazy loading. But only then. On the other side, if we talk about micro frontends, we talk about individual systems that are not known at compile time. We only know them during runtime. And so this was not really possible before. But module federation which has been shipped this october with webpack 5 will make this possible for this module federation gives you two roles the first role is called the host in my case the host is the shell and the second role is called the remote in my case the remote is the microphone and now you can configure the shell you can map buffs. You can say, hey, the buff MFE1, which stands here for micro frontend one, points over there to this very micro frontend. Every time I'm using it, I want to load something from over there. By the way, here we could use an alias. We could say, well, what's called MFE1 here is called MFE7 over there. In this case, 
it's called the same way on both sides. So it's a non-alias, if you ask me. On the other side, within the remote, we can expose files. We can say, hey, let's expose this Ivy component or this module under that name. And then something beautiful happens. Then you can use a dynamic import pointing over there. And this dynamic import makes sure you can load the exposed file from the remote. The best about this is, is that Angular does not even recognize that we are loading something that has been separately compiled and separately deployed. Because from Angular's perspective, this is just lazy loading. Angular does not know about micro frontends, but Webpack does. Underneath the covers, Webpack makes sure that this separately compiled and deployed chunk is loaded on demand when we are using this URL. Or to put it in another way, we don't need any meta framework anymore orchestrating different micro frontends. Just use Angular, just use lazy loading, and let Webpack do the heavy lifting. Of course, the shell needs some metadata about the micro frontend, and module federation is generating this metadata for you. When you build an application, module federation emits a remote entry point. And this contains all the metadata, and so you need to load this remote entry point into your shell. For this, there are several ways. You can do it statically, like here, you can do it in a dynamic way uh, with some helper functions. One of the best things of module federation is you can share libraries. You can say, hey, let's share Angular core. We need Angular core here. We need Angular core there. Let's just load it once. That's vital because if we have 10 micro frontends, we do not want to load Angular 10 times. That would be quite an overhead, would it? So now the big question is, how can we use these nice new features together with Angular and especially with the Angular CLI? And for this, I have a good message for you. The Angular CLI is using Webpack underneath the covers. This is not a big deal. It is delegating to Webpack when it comes to building an application. This is the good message. The bad message is that the CLI is shielding Webpack from us. Honestly, most of the times this is also good because most of the times we don't want to get in touch with Webpack and its complexity. It is really cool that the CLI is doing everything for us. But now this is a challenge. Because now we have our module federation config and somehow we want to delegate it to Webpack. And because it's shielded from us, this is quite difficult. But the good message is for accomplishing this, we can use an official solution, namely a builder. The CLI is using builders to build applications and libraries. A builder is something like an exchangeable strategy an exchangeable strategy allowing us to influence how this or that build step looks like. That means everything we need to do is create a custom builder, which is delegating the module federation config to Webpack. And then this custom builder can delegate to the default builder, the default builder provided by the CLI using Webpack for building an application. Of course, you can do this by hand, but I have already done this for you. You find this package on NBM, Angular Architects Module Federation, and basically it does three things for you. It generates the skeleton of the Module Federation config. It installs this custom builder, enabling Module Federation, and for debugging purposes, it assigns a new board for ng-surf so that you can uh, ng-surf your micro front-end side by side. To make use of it, just ng-add it to your project, just the generated configuration, and ng-surf or ng-build everything. Let me quickly show you an example for this.
for this, let me switch over to my shell. This here is my shell. It has two main menu items, home and flights, and this is my micro front end. And when I click here at flights, we see that my micro front end is loaded on demand. It's directly loaded into the middle, into the working area of my shell. Let's have a look at the network tab to find out what happens here. When I'm clicking here, then the chunk from over there from localhost 3000 is lazy loaded and used by my shell. And if you say, well, this is just lazy loading, no, it's more because here we have localhost 3000 and here we have localhost 5000, which clearly shows we are loading something from a different origin, something that has been separately compiled and deployed. If we look at the bundle size, we also see this is pretty tiny. This has about 10 Ks, which is really not much. And I think that proves that now Angular itself is shared. Angular itself is shared between the shell and the micro front end, because otherwise we would have a far bigger bundle. Okay, cool. So at the end of the day, everything you need to do to make this work is to implement your applications, the micro front end, the shell. Then you need to activate module federation with the plugin we've talked about. And then you just need to adjust the configuration and that's it. You can load stuff from other applications. If you ask me, this is really a game changer because this was not really possible before. If you say now, boy, this is nice. When can I use it? Then I want to uh, show you this little tiny roadmap. The good message is Webpack 5 is final. You can immediately use it. Also CLI 11 is final, however, the Webpack 5 integration into the CLI 11 is an experimental opt-in. Experimental means, obviously, it is not intended for production, pro production usage. So you can use it for prototyping, for trying everything out, for making sure you are ready when it is stable, but don't use it currently for production. However, things will change. With CLI 12, which is due in May, we will get a stable Webpack 5 integration. And then you can start using all of this in production to implement your micro front-end solutions and or your plugin-based solutions. If you like this topic, then check out our free ebook. You can find it here at angulararchitect.io slash book. And if you don't like to read that much, we also have a workshop which contains this topic in depth, but also other topics like an ex mono repo, strategic design, state management, performance. And we do it next month in German and in March uh, in English. It's fully online and interactive. So feel free to check this out. Okay, let me come to a conclusion. We have seen that module federation is a real game changer and that it allows you to load separately compiled and deployed stuff. We have also seen that this is nice for micro frontends because this is what micro frontends are about. And we have seen we can engage it with Angular to make it work together with Angular and the CLI. So it is pretty straightforward. Okay, that's it from, from me. I have already uploaded my material to my blog. So feel free to check out my slides and examples there. So I've promised to limit myself to 15 minutes. I think more or less I've managed to do it. And so I would say, let's go on with the second short talk. Uh, it is provided by Mikey, who will tell you a lot about his experiences with micro frontends in the practice. So please, Mikey, 
the stage is yours. Thank you, Manfred. Thanks for the intro. And hello to everyone on the wire outside our online meetup. Um, I'm happy to talk today about uh, micro apps in the real world, and I will focus on routing strategies, actually. Um, so maybe the whole romantic and, and engagement stuff that, that Manfred already mentioned, maybe I will also mention some parts that are not that nice at the moment. But nevertheless, we need to solve those um, uh, those, those things in, in, in practice. Therefore, I will mention it, of course, in one of those topics that are not really easy to handle in the micro front and micro app world is actually the whole routing stuff. So first of all, I will give you a short introduction, clarifying some terms, and later on, we will dig deeper into the routing area and I will talk you, uh, tell you about, about some learnings concerning um, what is actually uh, the hard part about the routing strategy with micro frontends. Uh, so what is this talk about? Uh, I will talk about micro frontends actually, of course, uh, the architecture around it and maybe when uh, we can use a, a built monolith instead of a dynamic uh, micro front end architecture. Um, I will also talk about the Angular support, of course, because th this is an Angular meetup actually. And uh, finally, the routing stuff, uh, the other, other parts like responsive design and state management. Um, I will keep them in the slide, but, uh, slides, but uh, upload this for you afterwards. But uh, I won't uh, dig deeper into those topics today. So to also keep my uh, talk focused on, on a certain time frame and on those topics highlighted in red. So who I am I? Uh, my name is Michael. I'm also working uh, together with Manfred and other colleagues in the uh, Angular Architects IO Trainers Network. I'm doing trainings and consultancies with focus on Angular. Uh, so I uh, also have uh, in-house and, and public workshops together and alone with together with Manfred and also um, alone or with other trainers. And um, I'm also focused on the German speaking area and sometimes also abroad in the uh, English speaking uh, countries in Europe as well. Uh, so you can follow me on Twitter and uh, let's now dive into those topics about micro frontends. Um, so what are those micro frontends everyone is talking about currently and are they always the best uh, solution to take? Uh, first of all, a short introduction, short uh, clarification about the terms uh, that we use uh, uh, talking about micro frontends. Uh, we did normally uh, try to uh, develop self-contained applications or features of certain applications. That's our aim uh, to build certain micro frontends or even separated uh, sets of features, smart components that can be used in uh, maybe several micro frontends as well. Um, they can be composed and can interact with each other. So. This is also the first step into that direction of state management and routing and putting things together and interacting between certain parts uh, of our whole application that is aligned or is, is separated into micro frontends. Um, our aim is, of course, to have a consistent user experience. So um, even if we have separated parts uh, for the user, uh, it should not be visible that we have uh, several developer teams and several separated deployments uh, and integration processes. At the end, we want to uh, provide an application with a good user experience with a consistent look and feel. Um, so the micro frontends also play together well with the whole um, strategy and architecture about uh, microservices in the back end. Um, and uh, on one hand, the micro frontends as well as the uh, microservice, this all leads to an independent uh, developer team. So this is always one of the major goals of having a micro frontend architecture um, to have separated developer teams um, that can work independently and do not need to have uh, those, those big uh, coordination efforts. So what else are the architectural targets breaking it down? Maybe we want to achieve independent builds, uh, maybe also independent deployments of these builds. Uh, it could also be um, a, a demand or a target for our architecture to have runtime integration. So to decide dynamically during runtime of the application, which part shall be integrated, maybe think of an app store the same could be accomplished with a web application um, 
targeting uh, micro frontends, we decide during the runtime of, of our application shell of our portal on which uh, parts, which functionality should be integrated dynamically. Um, having some, some signatures and types um, ready or respecting some signatures and types, uh, but nevertheless having the possibility to dynamically um, integrate this into the application sh shell without rebuilding the whole uh, application shell to get this functionality added. Um, maybe it's also uh, a target to integrate not only Angular, but also other uh, frameworks and libraries like React, like Vue, like maybe a plain vanilla JavaScript uh, application, all those um, things are, are relevant for, for practical purpose. That means uh, different companies have uh, maybe also the demand to integrate not only one framework and library, but different ones. Um, also different dependency versions uh, is, is sometimes or often a, a big architectural target, but keep in mind, this is uh, hard to maintain and hard to manage. That means uh, having only one uh, dependency version for all your applications that live in one and the very same window object is always uh, the better way to go. Uh, managing different uh, dependency versions is hard, actually. It leads to mainly to errors. Um, so let's post another question. Do micro apps really help to build professional web applications? Is this really the case or is it just a, a trending, a hype uh, topic uh, currently? Uh, out that everyone wants to uh, implement and everyone wants to use, but is it really also um, uh, recommended for professional web applications? And uh, to answer this question, we need to, to break it down a little bit. Um, we want to achieve certain architectural targets. Um, we want to, it, it requires to have then a application shell so that everything works together smoothly, the whole user experience as well as the, um, uh, the, the, the integration, the communication, the data exchange between the shell and all the applications, actually. Um, runtime integration definitely has, has some downsides. So it's not uh, the easiest task to accomplish runtime integration, and it leads to less predictability compared uh, to an application where you know everything during build time. And this also leads, uh, therefore, to a higher effort of writing end-to-end -end tests and also clarifying whether everything matches together um, during runtime uh, correctly. So you should, should consider alternatives if it is not uh, really necessary for you to have runtime integration. So without uh, this requirement, without the requirement of uh, different technologies to be used, uh, then please think of having a, a built monolith configuration where you know everything during build time. And this would also be the default way working with Angular. Uh, but how does it look like actually um, with the support for micro front end implementations currently um, out in the wild, um, focusing today on, on Angular as well. Uh, how does this work? Uh, micro frontends um, in a built monolith, if we choose to have separated um, uh, implementations for certain applications, but nevertheless, we know everything during build time, then we could go for, for the built monolith. This is, as mentioned, the default strategy and uh, the way to go if you do not need the runtime integration. But we have other options today as well. And one option that is coming up and has the, the first uh, POC implementation ready is the one with uh, Module Federation. The reason we are um, we are here today, actually, um, we can use Module Federation um, to to try it out currently to work with uh, an opt-in approach at the moment and to try out out those concepts on how to integrate. Um, different uh, implementations during runtime that are, are not known during build time and integrate them um, into our application shell, actually. So the first situation uh, is we have micro frontends with module federation where we use the very same dependency versions. So if this is the case, we can work with module federation like we would work with lazy loading with the Angular router, but in this case, dynamically. So working with the Angular framework lazy load link capabilities, um, it's also possible to, to load some implementations at a later point of time. But nevertheless, um, it requires that everything is known, known during build time. This changes then with module federation. So the moment we are choosing to go with module federation, we ha can have those uh, separated uh, built in deployment processes. But nevertheless, if we use the same dependency versions, we can just integrate um, our 
uh, dynamically loaded module, just like we would do it with load children uh, routing definition with, with normal lazy loading, but the build process is complete, completely separated. So quite nice thing, and I would say respecting this requirement, having the same version, um, it's the smoothest and, and best end integration possible um, that you have a, a, a good compromise between um, different uh, different points of time of your compilation and nevertheless smooth experience with the whole uh, Angular framework. But it's also possible to have um, micro frontends as, as web components, and this would also uh, be similar to the situation if you have uh, micro frontends with uh, module federation where you do not have the very same dependency versions. In those cases, you can either go with web components or you can also go with, mod with the module federation approach. But uh, in this case, you need to bootstrap a whole application, a whole Angular application. And the support for this um, concerning the angle related to the Angular framework is not uh, not that that good actually. Um, you need to to build up uh, your own loader, so it doesn't work directly with with the lazy loading load children approach. Uh, you need to add a, a script tag. You need to bootstrap your Angular application or your React or your Vue application that you want to add, and um, Therefore, you also have no access to the dependency injection tree of Angular anymore. So it needs some custom in implementation. But for this scenario, you have the benefit of having different dependency uh, versions possible. So maybe deploying one application um, in, in, in one month and, and three months later, you add a, another micro front end. And the, the first one doesn't necessarily need to be updated, has its own dependency versions, but nevertheless, it's not that smooth as the as the uh, approach mentioned before where you have module federation and the same dependency versions. You can use uh, custom builders to achieve this. Um, at the moment with NGX Build Plus, uh, it's required for the for the mod module federation approach as well as for web components to have a, um, a, a smooth um, um, a configuration on how to build your web components and your module federated uh, app micro front ends to put them together. So when do I uh, choose which approach now? Um, what is the right approach for me? Um, the build monolith, everything is known at build time, same versions, and you can nevertheless use the patterns of domain-driven design to separate all your implementations of certain apps and certain features of your apps and the domain logic and so on in separated libraries. So all those uh, patterns you know from domain-driven design are applicable for the build monolith as well. And therefore, we can achieve a similar strategy as with um, uh, separated parts, um, although we are building uh, everything at the, at the very same um, point of time as something changes. You can also use the caching capabilities of the NX workspace if you're using this library um, to have enterprise scale mono repositories. Um, we can also use model federation with uh, uh, same dependency versions as mentioned. This is the brings the benefit of dynamic cross origin integration, as you have seen it um, uh, in the in the talk um, Manfred provided before. Uh, that means my micro frontends could even run uh, on, a, on a different origin, nevertheless uh, can be integrated into one application shell. Um, we can therefore have different build and deployment processes, but we require to have the same version for this lean approach, for this smooth approach with the Angular framework, and of course. Webpack 5 is necessary. That means um, all the versions of Angular cannot be easily migrated to this scenario because then we need to update, of course, the Angular version so that we can also use the, the most current Webpack 5 work, version actually as well. And then the third uh, possible um, way to go is uh, module federation with different dependency versions. As mentioned, we are bootstrapping different Angular applications here. Um, we do not share the dependency injection tree. That means uh, if I have an Angular router, for example, in the application shell, I do not have access in my micro front end to the very same instance of this router. So that means I need to deal on, on having two, maybe two router instances ready at the very, uh, very uh, same point of time in the very same window object. Um, but shared uh, dependencies are possible. Um, compar comparable, this approach is comparable to web components and Angular root components, actually. And now focusing on the routing part, what actually changes if I'm uh, if I'm looking at, at the aspects about uh, routing and URL changes, actually. So this is a part that is not easy to tackle and not easy to implement um, to 
really have a smooth um, integration of all your um, micro apps in one and the same window object uh, in one and the same application shell. So what do we need to take care about? Um, independent versions um, that we bootstrap. So if we have different dependency versions, the third um, possible option I mentioned before, um, then in, in this case, we have more, more than one router instance in the very same window object and they somehow need to work together to have uh, the correct um, processing and the correct uh, change of the of the URL in, in our browser bar, actually. Um, also, other frameworks and libraries could change the URL outside of Angular. And this is also a, a situation where our application shell needs to uh, be ready to, to actually um, nevertheless uh, um, have the, the, the a consistent routing uh, experience across over all the applications uh, built with maybe different libraries and frameworks. Um, Angular overrides the URL. Um, that means uh, if I have two router instances and one is changing the URL and um, then the, the other router would actually react on this URL, um, then it may lead to certain uh, errors where uh, different parts of the URL are not configured in one of the micro front ends and this could lead to um, having maybe a certain named outlet not ready and this could lead to errors in your, your one of your Angular uh, Macro front ends actually. Uh, URLs could also be overlapping. That means maybe uh, two or three application uh, applications want to change uh, the very same segment of a URL, and therefore the applications. Um, uh, if one application changes a certain segment, then the other application doesn't know how uh, to correct uh, to react correctly on this change. Actually, so what could be the target for such a routing concept? Um, we could ask the question, how many applications actually need to be active in the shell at the very uh, same point of time? Is it only one application? Then it's quite easy. Um, is it more than one application? Then it's it's getting quite quite hard, hard actually. Do those applications have the, have the demand to change the URL? So does the application itself wants to change the URL or is it fine for my architecture that the application just um, raises an event, um, emits an event, and uh, the shell on its own is then the only one who changes the, the UL uh, for, for the whole application. This would then be an easier approach. So uh, the responsibility of changing uh, the URL then is only uh, inside the shell and uh, the, the macro app itself won't, won't ever change the URL actually. Um, is it necessary to manage more than one route at the same time? That means uh, also referred to the to the first question. Um, if I have uh, several applications that are um, that that need to be actively at the very uh, same point of time in in my application shell, then it's likely that I have different URL informations that should coexist next to each other. And there is an Angular concept already uh, present that we could use for this. Um, maybe also deep linking between apps and also between shell and apps could be uh, a target that we want to achieve. Um, also, this is really a hard one. Um, are apps really allowed to be nested into each other? So having one app with a root configuration that um, hosts another app um, that also has some, some routing information. This is one of the hardest parts, parts actually to accomplish, but also possible. So possible strategies to solve this would be named router outlets. Um, so looking at the normal Angular router behavior, we could implement uh, such a strategy where we have a, a root for the, for the shell itself. And then we have this parent thesis um, uh, presentation of the URL where we have two different um, root definitions for two different micro apps. So this may be the root definition for a flights micro app, and this would be the root definition for a passenger's micro app. And then uh, each of these root definitions of this named root outlet can have its own path information that would not uh, um, have any conflicts between each other because I can manage them separately. Uh, but what are the challenges actually? If I would build this with a built monolith, it would be quite easy. Uh, but having this dynamic uh, integration approach, it's it's really getting harder. Uh, even to although the router uh, knows this concept of named outlet, it's it's getting harder. Um, so named uh, routing outlets um, 
need to have a a, a conflict that that is um, uh, that is present in the in the application. That means if I want to navigate to a router outlet flight and the router outlet flight is not known in my application, the router uh, would error in the default configuration. That means I somehow need to tell the router if there is a certain outlet not configured in your um, micro app, then please don't freak out. Um, maybe another micro app can, can deal with this. Um, but this needs to be implemented and patched on our own. The Angular router does not have an implementation for this. Um, the Angular router uh, also allows na named outlet on different levels. That means you could run into such URL configurations where I have a, a parent thesis um, uh, parentheses mentioned here in this segment and then starts another segment and another uh, parentheses information. That also means that the router outlet are on, on different levels attached to different levels of your route. And this, this actually makes it very tricky to implement deep linking because maybe one or certain route configuration needs to be activated so that the router outlet is available and that the sub route, the named outlet then can be rendered. So it's also tricky um, to be aware not uh, mixing up different levels of named outlets in your routing configurations, actually. Also, the history API makes some um, issues, actually, because uh, if I push uh, a state into the history API of my, my browser, then the router normally does not recognize this. So I need to patch the uh, push state API, actually, to tell the router to react on uh, different changes. This could only also happen, of course, if, if uh, I'm working in an Angular application shell and the React application may change the URL, um, then the normal uh, browser APIs do not offer me an option to subscribe to this URL change that was made by, by uh, source code, actually. Um, and therefore, I need to monkey patch the push state API to make this happen uh, so that I have a trigger point and, have, and know, actually, when certain parts of my application change the, uh, the history API and therefore also the, the URL that is uh, currently visible. So possible solutions to solve this, uh, in general, custom implementations are necessary to patch the router. Central definitions need to be respected so that every app and also the shell knows about the signature on how to uh, work with the router actually and how to change some routing configuration. Um, we could think of implementing a, a custom router outlet um, that allows you to have dynamic bindings on the router outlet name because the default one in the framework does not support this, but it's uh, quite easy to implement a, a custom router outlet that would uh, allow bindings to the outlet name. And this would make some um, uh, make it easier to, to implement certain macro front end um, uh, solutions, actually. Um, would also be helpful to have a router link that automatically publishes the, the source of the navigation. So if I'm clicking on a router link, maybe it is relevant who actually activated this URL. Uh, if it was one micro app or the other one or the shell, the shell, we could also implement a, a non-directive that actually gives us this information to a central service um, so that we may have an observer stream to subscribe to get the information. Um, who is actually the source of this navigation. Um, as mentioned, monkey patching the push API would be a, a good idea um, to, to have really the ability to change on any, uh, to react on any URL change independently who actually did it. And uh, filtering URL segments um, uh, could also be a, a good approach to, to avoid uh, the router outlet errors I mentioned before. Um, also converting um, the URL from an internal app um, the def URL definition to an external uh, shell compatible URL definition could also be accomplished. Um, so also we can um, uh, use dependence injection to um, configure some, some own logic and implement some own logic um, to transform the URL that way um, that we have an internal and external view of the URL and, and could avoid some, some conflicts concerning different micro apps. And we could also uh, choose a strategy to prevent certain apps uh, um, that they are not allowed uh, to change the URL actually, so that we somehow deactivate the possibility for certain apps to um, push a new state to the history API and change the URL therefore. So to finalize my presentation, what are the key takeaways? Uh, web components are, and, and also micro frontends that are somehow dynamically are not always the best way. Um, please, if you want to use them, 
plan with a uh, with a mature application shell that has some infrastructure that's capable of handling especially uh, those mentioned uh, routing um, um, configurations and routing conflicts that may occur between uh, different micro apps. Um, URL changes in general in general are, are critical, so be aware of this and, and plan um, for your projects to to take a deeper look uh, at at those um, infrastructure implementations that are necessary for such a micro. Uh, dynamic micro application, micro front end um, infrastructure. And also think of responsive design and uh, on how to do the state management, the communication and the integration of certain parts. Um, it's only uh, grayed out because not it, not because it's not important, but I had no focus for this presentation for today, but you will find the respective slides in, in the slide deck that I will upload uh, afterwards. So, uh, thanks for this. And if you're interested into some follow-up topics, you can look into those uh, resources. Um, Angular Architects blog, uh, where some there are some blog posts from, from Manfred that are very interesting concerning micro frontends and module federation. Also, the NX library um, is very helpful uh, for everything connected to Angular development, but also for micro frontends. UMD bundles are not that relevant anymore, at least as soon as we have uh, module federation production ready. And yeah, all these concepts I presented today, I will put them in a in a library. Uh, I'm working on this and also look at Brandon Roberts' new uh, declarative router. It's also very interesting. That is an alternative to the normal angle router actually. You can find my coordinates here and yeah, would be nice if you follow me on Twitter. Thanks and I will hand back to Manfred. That was awesome. Thank you, Michael. It was really nice. So Thanks. let's get everyone on the stage. And let's get started with the Q&A part. Uh, Connie has meanwhile uh, discovered, I guess, some questions in the chat. So please, Connie, it's your turn. So Manfred is still loading, so I will take over uh, and start the discussion panel, I guess. Um, so we have really exciting guests in our discussion panel. So I first want to ask a few questions to, to Pias, because we're really excited to have you here. Uh, you created Webpack, and I heard a rumor that Webpack was actually um, part of your master thesis. Is this true? Uh, it's it's um, not correct, completely correct, but it's it's um, it's partly correct because it was um, not part of my master thesis, but a, a side project of my master thesis. So I, I made a, my master thesis about a web application and I was looking for a bundler for optimizing web applications. So I created Webpack at this time during my master thesis um, as a side project to to make, make an optimization for web applications and open sourced it. So, yeah. We're all glad he did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice. So yeah, now we actually now we actually have the fifth version of it. Of what were and we heard already that module federation is a part of that. What were the biggest challenge you had when implementing module federation? Uh, phew. <laughs> Good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, what was the trickiest thing? Um, I think um, the trickiest thing was um, an, an edge case where all this micro federation stuff is more, much stuff is based on promises because everything is loading asynchronously and also modules are loading asynchronously. And there was an edge case um, where you have some cycular dependency between um, micro front ends and um, this was a really tricky bug to discover, and um, it's kind of there was pro promising waiting on each other, and everything is hanging. And to solve this, I I think I spent a whole day just only to fix this uh, edge case about cycle dependencies between micro front ends. So a really tricky thing. Okay, as everybody who worked with Angular JS, we know circular dependencies are always a problem. <laughs> So nice we, we understand the game, but yeah. of course, those were a whole set of different problems, I guess. Um, so what I was really interested is um, 
uh, of course, I think you still working in the future of Modern Federation. Uh, what can we expect? Are there any more features? What are your plans for Modern Federation in the future? So, yeah, I think since two months, I didn't do anything on Modern Federation. It, it, it's really kind of partially, partially finished. It's not that much missing there, but there are little features which could be implemented in the future, like a hot module placement for, for Modern Federation, so you can like uh, use hot module, hot, module for the, uh, hot module replacement with module federation when there are hot updates between micro front ends and so currently you have to reload the whole page but and um, the whole hot experience would be cooler if it's like possible with module federation too uh, yeah that and sounds really nice <laughs> And, but module federation is not the only part of Webpack 5. Um, what are other features besides module federation which are really cool? Yeah, so the, I think the biggest feature in Webpack 5 is um, that we have no, per persistent caching. So we can, um, so in Webpack 4, we only store uh, the cache. We cached a lot of things in memory. So if you close the process or restarted the Webpack or the Angular CLI, then everything has to recompile again. And with Webpack 5, we have now the ability to uh, persist the cache on, on disk or on file system and also with plugins on network servers or something like that. So it's very reliable and persistently storable. Um, so it can restore faster when you're restarting your Angular CLI or Webpack in general. Awesome. Th thank you so much for this quick introduction. Uh, and now I want to introduce another panelist we have here. I hope panelist is the right word, I don't know. Uh, Natalia is here and uh, Natalia wrote a really cool article recently that I just read today about micro front ends and why you might not use them. Um, so I want to ask you, um, what do you think are possible problems with micro front ends? And uh, what are your concerns when when you implement yeah. the micro front end? Thank you, Connie. Um, I think the intention of the article was not to discourage people from using micro front ends, uh, rather uh, for them to really think well about them before implementing them. Um, because obviously, when you are um, interacting with applications that are out of of your control. Maybe, perhaps, mm, that's one of the intentions when you split your application into micro front ends. And that's uh, certainly at a, an enterprise level, one of the um, desires is to have independent teams, to have independent deployability, to have um, as little coordination between teams as possible. Um, but that's, that's really nice in theory, in practice, it's very complicated to achieve. Um, so that was the intention that that uh, everyone put a lot of thought on, uh, especially things like uh, orchestration, like state management, um, like dependency sharing, and yes, and that they contemplated the possibilities of things not going right straight away. Um, you also wrote in your article that it's really important to plan your host or your shell or whatever you call it very well. And do you really think about what's going to be in the shell and what not? And there were also a few questions uh, concerning this from uh, the people out there who are listening to us. Um, and so one of the question was if I have shared CSS or shared interfaces, where should I place them? Should I put them in the shell? Should I put them somewhere else? If I want to have a, like very consistent consistency throughout my application or throughout my product? Well, I think ideally it's the shell, it's the host that should take care of um, making those available to all the other micro frontends. 
but we have to consider that it will very much depend on the level of encapsulation of each one of the front ends if they are even able to consume from those dependencies. Mm -hmm. um, so this is one of the pain points, uh, obviously. Um, and that's where you have to put a lot of thought at, uh, um, during the initial design of the architecture of the application. Where are those assets that are potentially shareable going to be at and how you're going to make them available to everyone um, to obviously have the best performance possible because we can be um, overfetching, overloading uh, assets that we, we may not need um, or we could be uh, potentially restricting our micro front ends from even being able to see them or to, to leverage them. So I hope that answers the question. But ideally, I, I, I envision the host as the first thing to ever load, and hence to have everything available right away for all the other micro front ends that come later to the picture. Yeah, I would actually fully agree. And, and all those, those assets um, um, issues are, are not easy to solve because uh, beginning mm -hmm. with, with uh, relative past resolutions and as you already mentioned on how to make have certain APIs on how to provide those assets on, on level of the shell because once again we're in the very same window object and uh, the, we have no browser API at the moment to have um, base URLs, uh, base RFs on, on level of each micro front and this is not possible at the moment it would solve some, some issues so the whole asset thing is, is a tricky one, actually. Yeah. yeah. The thing is that. So we um, also have a follow-up question for that. Um, you mentioned that state management would also go into the shell. How would how, how would you manage it without recoupling the micro frontends? I think state management is it's pro potentially the other most complicated thing. I don't know if it should go in the shell or even one layer above or below, how you want it, um, in the browser itself. I think that um, an event-driven strategy is potentially the most accessible way for every um, for every micro front end to yes to to access APIs that are there that you don't have to abstract and that. Um, and that you can leverage. Of course, you're, it's not going to be the same to be um, to be using a publication subscriptions uh, um, pattern um, to having a full Redux or um, NGRX or whatever is the pattern recommended by the by the framework you're using. Uh, but yes, it's going. You're going to have to also put a lot of thought into that and definitely the host is going to be involved uh, in a lot of aspects of, of probably storing, even if not persistently, but uh, for the moment, whatever events you may want to make available for everyone else to react to, like uh, the, the, the publication of a topic uh, for other micro front ends to subscribe and stuff like this. Not sure if Manfred has any comments or mic or to yes. Well, I, I think at the end of the day, it's always a trade off. Mm, my situation. internet is currently pretty bad. So um, if, if, if it gets too bad, um, Manfred, you have to take over. Sorry, I didn't hear you. What? I, I think, I think she, she mentioned this, the stream quality is, is getting low on her side there. Oh really? Okay, interesting. Okay. Is it is it is it okay? Should I go on? Or is it okay, oh. my internet? Or? I think you have a tiny delay, but it's okay. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's also okay. There's a really big latency. Um, I am supposed okay, to say something. So I will go on with asking you questions. Okay. I did not ask Michael anything so far. So um, 
<laughs> okay, sorry. Um, what is the best thing for you about Modern Federation? Are you excited about Modern Federation or is it just another approach to do uh, micro frontends? Uh, yeah, it's actually making a lot of things easier that we try to solve some with some, I would say, hacky workarounds until now. Um, having to use UMD bundles for similar cases, sharing dependencies. I, I would say that the whole topic about sharing dependencies uh, is the most beneficial one. Uh, of course, also the runtime integration uh, um, that that is uh, e far easier possible and and possible also with with far more than uh, JavaScript technologies compared to the ways we we needed to hack around with, with ECMAScript 5 and, and UMD bundles and so on. So yeah, actually uh, it's it's a, a solid and mature um, way uh, that, that uh, Tobias has implemented that helps us a lot. And what I like most of it is um, he actually implemented it with, with infrastructure in mind. And nevertheless, we can easily um, integrate it on, on layers above actually. Um, Easy. It's only easy for me because Mantra did a very good prototype already, but it wasn't that easy for you actually. Uh, figuring all those aspects out connected with Angular, of course. Um, but nevertheless, um, we have a, a working prototype where the technology that Tobias provided and the prototype that um, uh, works together with the with the Angular um, ecosystem that Manfred provided uh, play together well, and this is actually a big benefit for us all. Uh, looking a little bit in the future on uh, what we can. Um, achieve beginning with maybe summer in for production apps as well. Yeah, totally. So if you ask me, one of the best things of uh, module federation is we don't need a lot of those workarounds anymore. Of course, if we want to mix and match different frameworks and different framework versions, we are back with web components. And in this case, we need all those workarounds and tricks you've talked about. But if you don't need this, it is really straightforward from Angular's perspective, from React's perspective, from Vue's perspective, it is just lazy loading. And Tobias is doing everything else underneath the covers, or let's say Tobias Webpack implementation is doing everything else, which is pretty nice. Yeah, you're a busy guy right now, working for all those Angular applications. <laughs> Everything implemented. So I, working. Oh, sorry. No problem. So if I would um, have a greenfield application where nothing is there, and I know it will be a big enterprise application and a lot of teams, HR teams are working on it. Should I choose micro front ends just because I know it's going to be really big? Or should I stick to the old approach, the monolith approach? Like, Depends how big. <laughs> so, so actually, the model federation or micro front end approach mostly has only drawbacks compared to a monolith, except for the things that you can work with multiple teams and deploy independently. But on all other aspects, it's mostly uh, not the best thing. It's it's worse in optimization. It's worse in runtime. It's challenging in in shared stuff it's challenging in state management stuff uh, everything uh, and it can crash on runtime uh, stupid things and so it it only depends i think the biggest question is if you use it um uh, do you need the ability to deploy each team independently and i think this would be the factor um if you really need this and if uh, if the application is so huge that a build monolith isn't possible from build time perspective or from deployment perspective. Then only and only then you should choose a micro front ends and micro stuff approaches. Natalia, I, I I know that you worked with customers or you yourself implemented already micro front ends. What were was like one of the use cases where you said it was absolute the decision was micro front ends. There was no other way. What could be an example for that? Um, I think one thing we, we, we can keep in mind is that we don't necessarily need to have multiple micro frontends to leverage uh, module federation. For example, we could uh, have one application that is independently built and we want to bring from a different origin, 
And in that particular case, I think it would start very well. And when, well, like um, Michael said, it's very good if you can have some governance of versions of certain parameters that we're going all to comply with. And then in these particular cases, I think that module federation is when it's, it's then going to, to make the real difference and it's going to enable independent teams to work perhaps in a feature, not necessarily in, in a ton of features independently, but in one feature that may have a very um, like fast development cycle and release cycle and you want to keep away from your monolith that maybe has, I don't know, a cycle of three weeks or four weeks or depending on, on how your team works. So in, for those particular cases, I think that that uh, module federation and and the whole micro uh, micro frontends um, architecture and patterns are perfect. Uh, just we shouldn't go over the board and say like everything will be a micro frontend now, <laughs> because this is when it gets messy. And yes, and then we we are facing performance issues and having to think about a lot of things that we may not necessarily know right away how to solve. A really good answer. We have another question from one of our listeners. Uh, he's asking um, about Angular elements and model federation. Um, can they somehow work together or are those completely different things or have they anything to do with each other? Yeah, totally. I think Mikey also mentioned it and we have a nice um, blog article on our website about this. What you could do is you could expose an Angular element via module federation. And this gives you the power of both of web components and of module federation. Thanks to module federation, you can share versions. Perhaps you have two different web components using Angular 10. Then those two web components can share Angular 10. And then perhaps you have two other web components using React in the version XYZ and then they can share React in this very version. And because you have uh, web components, perhaps on the basis of Angular elements or something else, you can make to make all of this work together, Angular, React, and this version, and that version. Mm. So you kind of yeah. supercharge your web components. Yeah, this is what I'm also calling the Frankenstein architecture, you know, this, <laughs> this German guy. <laughs> Do you know? Yeah. Do you know if somebody already uses that successfully in a big application, or is it really, really new? And yeah, I, ha I have several customers that are using this approach, and I think Mikey also have several customers using this approach. The thing is, it is not that easy. It is not a turnkey solution because, as Mikey mentioned, now you have several routers, a React router, an Angular router, perhaps another Angular router, the Shells router working together, or that needs to work together. And that's not that easy. For this, you need some dirty workarounds. Uh, but or, some, or some consulting. Or some consulting, yeah. <laughs> 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 so I would come back to the thing that Natalia said. First of all, you need to find out if you really need it, because this effort is not worth it if you're not needed. But just to give you one, to give you one uh, case study, uh, especially banks like this uh, this approach, because in banks you have different teams specialized in different topics. One team is specialized in stocks and another team is uh, specialized into managing your account and another team is specialized into loans. And somehow you need to bring all this knowledge together for a typical e-banking solution or an internal uh, solution for customer management. And so uh, using the module federation or in general micro front end approach really feels natural there, even though you have all those drawbacks. About team organization and stuff, we also have a question here. I will just read it out. Uh, who would be best to own the shell when having HI teams for each feature? Would it be possible to have some sort of micro front and discovery registry when pointing to remote using Webpack module federation? 
would definitely say yes. Um, really think of a, a comparable infrastructure like you have it on smartphones and tablets with an app store. Um, it's it's similar to that. You can can implement your application shell, um, put it uh, as a picture like a. Uh, uh, infrastructure that is necessary to to host your micro apps actually, and there should be an infrastructure team dealing only with the shell and and with all the features that belong to the shell and how to make, as you mentioned, uh, the um, service application discovery in this case. Um, so yes, this I would say this this is uh, a central feature of the application shell, and uh, part of the infrastructure to work with with micro frontends actually yeah, that you need to implement. Yeah. And have a solution for this. I hope that answers that question. Um, we also had a question before um, that was about communicating between micro front ends. Um, if I have micro front ends, if I have communication of micro front ends, is there uh, kind of an overload of communication or web API calls or something like that? Would it be a drawback for micro front ends? Yeah, it's a contradiction in itself. The thing is, on the one side, you want to have decoupled micro front ends, and on the other side, you have the need to communicate between them. But you cannot have both. You cannot have the cake and eat it, as the Americans say. And that means we need to find the sweet spot between those two extremities. Um, in my experience, in most systems, it is enough to have only, let's say, a handful messages that are passed around because all the micro front end should be self-contained. But sometimes you need some context data to pass around, like who is the current user or about which dates do we talk? Do we talk about this quarter or the last quarter? about which tendons do we talk or about which customer or in the hospital, about which patient do we talk. Context information, the user does not want to select all the time within all the micro front ends. But besides this, uh, they should do the, their own stuff and they should not demand upon data another micro front end has loaded because this brings up all this, this coupling we want to prevent with this architectural style. What do you think, Natalia? Do your do your customers have experience with that, or do you? It is ex exactly what Manfred Manfred said. So you're trading off, right? And 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 if you want that freedom and that uh, independence, you should not uh, have an architecture that is tightly coupled because that's incompatible. Hmm. It's one thing or another. Yes. I would also all, almost fully agree with just one uh, thing that comes into my mind. Um, if you have just this cross-origin sync, that uh, one very complex component uh, in one of your domains needs to run on a different origin, it's not often the case that this is necessary. Then, um, and only then, if you're using the very same dependency versions I, I mentioned in my talk, then you could also uh, think of using the dependency injection tree um, within Angular. And this scenario would theoretically make it possible that you, for, for instance, uh, have a, a common um, NGRX store available on the top level where uh, different applications from different origin um, uh, collect their state and put it together. But I would say that this is most of the time a real edge case. Normally, you strive for having these isolated parts, and therefore, it's not necessary and not intended to have this coupling on the on the data and state area, actually. Depending. There's a follow-up question um, to before when we talked about um, sharing the Webpack config. Um, he was actually talking about uh, sharing it kind of remote and not um, hard linking it. Is this also possible, if I understand correctly? Can you maybe repeat this once again? I, I, I didn't get it fully. Uh, he wrote, I was thinking of hard linking the remote. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, I see. I, may, maybe it's it's in this direction, Manfred, um, the differentiation between dynamic and, and uh, uh, bootstrap integration of Modular Federation. Yeah, that, that is possible. I have just read the, the question. I think that goes mm -hmm. in this direction and involves some kind of lookup service or discovery service. 
Yeah, I, I, I have prepared something for that. If you want to. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the question was about um, how to manage the configuration because usually in the in the configuration you have to um, put in your your links or your URLs to to your micro front ends, but on the other side you want to have this kind of um, discovering or registry layer which kind of decides at runtime where your micro front end is or which version of micro front micro front end to choose um, and. I think there are like four approaches which can be used. So one thing is um, that you can use an internal module to to delegate the, the microphone and loading. So you can also maybe you can prefix here um, on the remote entries. You can prefix like which type of remote this should be. You can also do it globally with remote type if you want to. But here I prefix it. So one idea that was also in the chat is that you can have like a JSON module where all your micro front ends URLs are like inside and you get, would load it at one time and then decide at one time where your micro front end is. And so in this case, you can use an internal module and this module is just um, delegates the, the logic of loading your micro front end. You can do anything like fetch and JSON, where, where microphone is allocated. Um, but I, this is like from performance perspective, it's like fetching and chasing, the loading the microphone is like three one tips, so it's not so good. Um, then another approach is to have like an API um, where you point your, your configuration at, and the IP, API just returns and redirect, so just redirects to your current microphone end you want to use. So if you Want to redirect to microphone version one, then it would redirect there, and you can decide in your database, whatever, um, where to redirect this to which version. So you can split the version at one time. Um, um, this would, is from per performance perspective, this is better because it only has two round trips, like one for the API redirect and the, the real um, microphone and source code. There are two other approaches like um, like this. You can just ex access the microphone from global variable and then put a script tag where the microphone is to you. At your HTML generation, you would just um, look it up in the database and put it into the HTML while loading. But in this case, you have to load this before your application. So it's like a, like a little bit performance-wise uh, suboptimal, but it's really good, but it's, could be better um, with this combining two techniques. So you just use the, the technique from, from version two, like an API. And at the same time, you can use this kind of data webpack attribute at your script tag. And when webpack tries to load this microphone that it will look up any script tags which has a special data webpack attribute and just attach to this and use it as, um, as microphone end. So it's kind of, you can load everything in parallel and asynchronously, and then we'll attach to that. Mm -hmm. These approaches possible. Nice. Nice. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, can you, for, for those who are watching, can you somehow share this also in a repository? Yes, I can do it. Mm -hmm. I, can do it. I think it would be help, uh, helpful for some of the people. Nice. So what we also do a lot is leveraging, I call it the Webpack Runtime API. I'm not sure, Tobias, if this is the official term, but uh, Webpack is placing some objects in the window object and you can use them at runtime to dynamically load or route to a remote. Yeah, this is this is basically what I did. I, I, I created a custom loader and check the index that is assigned to the function in the remote entry and was loading that or calling that function. And that was loading the, the, the microphone. Like it was loading a, an Angular web component or element uh, in a JavaScript uh, vanilla application uh, in, this, in this way. So that's, that's another way to potentially do it. But you have to really look into all that code that was like outputs <laughs> to, 
to to look for the name of the function. Um, there was one more question from Ali. Uh, he asked, um, is it normal that micro front end application call services from each other? Yeah, actually you, you can have um, shared dependencies. Um, that is also possible with, with um, the, the POC that Manfred described, um, where you can uh, have either, either um, NPM libraries, normal dependencies, or uh, also shared dependencies lying in your mono repository um, that would then be uh, available during runtime with the very same reference that could be shared between um, different applications. So as you're you really technically also using um, the very same reference, you could even uh, use this for communication purposes, yeah. So okay, so if I... From technical point of view, you can do anything you can do in a monolithic application. You can just import the module from any other microphone and attach properties to that, whatever, uh, write an event emitter or something. So everything that's possible in a monolithic application is also possible from communication wise in a, a microphone and application. You can call methods of other modules if you want to, or yeah, do whatever we want. <laughs> But in, can... only because it's possible from technical point of view, it's not that way common that you should like think about your architecture, what you ways you're communicating with. Right. <laughs> yeah. So um, I would limit myself to a tiny amount of services to share between the micro front ends. Perhaps I would only use a message service, which allows me to pass some events around to do some message passing because when I'm starting to depend upon a lot of other services from other micro front ends. They are not isolated anymore. They are depending upon each other. So I, I would try to, to limit this to a minimum. But technically, of course, it's possible. Would be sharing um, some kind of dependency mechanism be a good solution? If you limit it to a minimum, like a message service, then I guess it's okay, but I would not overdo this. Yeah, I would also yeah. for, for central services, like if you have an authentication service or something like that, mm. then you can make access it in a very coupled way. Uh, but it's a central service or like what you usually put in a shell or would put in, the, in a central microservice that is generally from coupling point of view, it's only one direction and it's kind of okay for me. The question was more about um, sharing something like Angular dependency in okay. applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you actually can do this, um, but you're also technically limited um, uh, beginning with the first time you have different versions. And if it's uh, even if it's um, uh, a minor version or a patch version that, that is different, you have uh, different references and also no way of, of sharing the dependencies. You would need to dig deep into the framework and build up the dependency injection tree uh, on your own and sharing dependencies. So it also would not be a technically uh, or the practically would not be a good idea because uh, mixing dependencies um, from a version that it was not tested with the, the current macro app um, uh, could, of course, lead to, to conflicts and, and, and errors that you uh, run into uh, during runtime that you have never tested before, actually. Yeah, and it defeats the purpose of uh, failing in, in, in isolation, right? So yeah. you, you want each micro front end to fail in isolation, not yeah. everything, the whole system down. Definitely. And also think of, of, of those situations, uh, also um, micro front end for, for the future and migrating existing applications um, to use uh, um, uh, Webpack 5 and Modular Federation in the future also means that you, of course, need to update the Angular version to the first one that then officially uh, supports Webpack 5, which will likely be Angular 12. So also think of this, um, of course, we have no option to, to work with Angular 6 applications in combination uh, with, with Modular Federation because it's simply not um, uh, uh, compatible to Webpack 5, actually. Thank you. Um, I, we don't have any more questions for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's answered, I guess. Um, 
Thank you very much for answering the questions. Cool, yeah. And I thank you, Connie, for collecting and answering those questions. Very appreciated. You're welcome. Okay, cool. So we are reaching the end. So thanks to everyone for joining. It was really great to have you here. And yeah, have a nice day. See you around. Have a nice day. Bye. 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 Bye.